All right. Well, thanks for joining uh, ACF Chat Fridays. It's a kind of office hours. You can just ask us anything, really. Uh, we'll show you and talk about what we've done in the last two weeks, uh, which obviously this week has been ACF 6.1 with custom post types and taxonomies. So hopefully uh, a few of you are here to ask some questions about that. Uh, we've got Anthony from the team uh, and Mike is uh, our content guy. So he's the, the one that handles writing uh, all of our blogs and, and kind of shepherding all of our documentation into shape. So uh, if you've got questions about that, he's the, he's the guy for that. Um, my, uh, Ian normally does a bunch of housekeeping stuff at the start, and he didn't give me any notes for this. So I'm just, I, I wrote some things down earlier as sort of ad hoc it. Uh, firstly, thanks for everyone that voted for us in the Talk Magazine's Plugin Madness competition. Uh, very happy to say ACF won that. Uh, we beat WooCommerce and all of the other WordPress plugins that, you know, we look up to as well. So amazing to win that again after we won the first one. So thanks for your votes there. Um, I wanted to say thanks to our translators. It's not something we we talk about a lot, but uh, for those of you that speak a language other than English, uh, we really appreciate all the translations. Um, with custom post types and taxonomy shipping in 6.1, we've almost doubled the amount of strings in ACF that nearly translated, um, and people have been really, really quick at jumping on top of that. Uh, we got 100% now on Portuguese Brazil, uh, Spain, Spanish, obviously, and uh, Dutch. So thanks to, especially to those folks, but everything else is ticking up nicely. I know there's a kind of inherent delay as you wait for approvals and stuff on translation. So yeah, thanks for that. Um, and yeah, we released ACF 6.1. Um, if you haven't checked it out, uh, I will post the blog post in chat. There you go. Some screenshots and, uh, you know, sort of demo things of what you can do there. So. Uh, Hopefully you've had a chance to check it out and we'll uh, have some uh, some questions from you. But yeah, we kind of just kick it open. Uh, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom if you want to ask a question there, or you can just ask it in chat, it's whichever is easiest for you, really. Uh, yeah, anyone uh, anyone got anything to talk about? Any, any, any things as questions or uh, any cool projects you're working on? that awkward moment where no one wants to go first yeah it's, uh, Nick, it's in the chat we got yeah, yeah yeah so Nick, nick's got a question about ACF extended uh which yeah absolutely um comrade often is in here he's not in here today but uh you know we use acf extended so we might be able to answer your question if not then uh, we can pass you over there's a, a, a an acf extended slack as well that we're all in as well as acf it's kind of the unofficial acf slack so we can always point you over there if we if we need anything else. I think I need to get an invite to that Slack. <laughs> I don't think I'm in that one. Yes, yeah, sure. Join with audio. Feel free to just unmute yourself and, and ask a question or you know, raise your hand. However you want to do it, it's it's fine. We're really relaxed here. So yeah, whatever works. For All you. right, thanks. Thanks for that. So I just have a question. Every time I would go through um, using extended, um, I keep running into different things, and it's hard to tell what the advantages of going with the pro would be because it seems as if there's a lot of stuff just chalked into it. But I, their documentation is odd to me and so i can't quite tell what they're saying it would actually do if i had some of those things matter of fact it's it's with the english is i don't know if <laughs> i'm not sure what's happening but it seems as if it's got um grammatical errors and things like that in it as well so it's kind of hard to tell what they're saying in one instance that it said something like it doesn't provide this thing but i was like that doesn't make any sense it seems like it should be saying it does provide this so there's a little bit of a confusion there. So no matter where I go, I can't find anyone who just even simply does a review of like what actually you get out of it. And then when I look at their videos they post, I usually like to listen to things in top speed because, um, <laughs> you know, like it's just easy to consume. But their videos are like 
super fast and and kind of confusing like what the um, what they're demonstrating so i just didn't know is there a place i can go to truly understand what i'm going to be getting from something like that if i were to sign up for what they call seats they have these seats that you can purchase and i want to get three of them for our organization and you know it's not free <laughs> so and i'm trying to figure out what would i actually get out of it because I keep running into little things I think I need, but I don't really know how to test it or how to see what it would do. I'm, I'm a little bit confused. So, yeah, no, that makes sense. I've so the ACF extended is is kind of a comrade, the developer. Um, he, I know he kind of gets a lot more freedom to just kind of throw things at the wall and see what sticks. Right? There's a bunch of tiny little things in ACF extended, and a bunch of bigger things as well that uh, that he can yeah you know, he can quickly roll out and test and it's a it's it's a really cool plugin for some very specific things that you might want to do. So the question is kind of like, are you just trying to? Are you, is there stuff that ACF doesn't do that you think that we should do that you're trying to get extended to fill, or are you just looking down the list of everything ACF extended does and thinking, hey, this is cool, this would be nice, and just trying to that, kind of. That's probably a really good question. Um, I'm assuming that. I don't know because there could be updates that I'm not realizing are going on in ACF. And we we just updated and I haven't even had the time to build anything with the new version. And I went from five, nine to six, two. Is that where we're at now? Six, uh, six, six, one. Yeah, six, one. Six, one something. Anyway. So, um, yeah, yeah. I was thinking six, two, if that's WordPress. Um, yeah. So. That is um, the downside of us being so so aligned to WordPress at the moment. We we do it all the time, and people keep talking like about ACF six point two. Yeah. So what what I typically like it for the the most what I like ACF and extended together for the most part is just the front end form part of being able to make everything on the front end. So I don't even know. Maybe I can do that with ACF, but I don't think I can. Um, so, so yeah, we have front end forms. There's some extensions to uh, the ACF extended provides, but most of those things are kind of UI elements that you can do in code. So ACF extended often does a lot of kind of things on the front end. Yeah, they right. had post types and taxonomies, and obviously we've now rolled that into to ACF four. Um, so most most of the time, and then you know, there's obviously a lot of different things, but but a lot of the front end forms things you can actually do them already. Uh, just by having to write code, which you, know, you might not be right. comfortable with and you might not want to do. But um, yeah, so it's, a, it's an extension of, of the ACF forms in core rather than a kind of standalone thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, you know, let's say comfortable with the code, but what I'm, un I'm, I'm uncomfortable with doing code I don't have to do. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. Because <laughs> it, it also is when it gets, you know, even when, you know, whether I'm using ACF or ACF extended, when it just produces it like, you know, perfectly formatted, like I can't really argue with that. So, you yeah, know, yeah. most of the time I use it to build things and just extract the code and dump the plugin for, you know, dump the access, you know, of the plugin. So, you know, I just, I have a big appreciation for the way that works, but I'm just trying to, figure out like all the little things that they do like i don't know how to understand you know what value i'm getting out of it i see that half the things are marked as pro and then you know some of them are like partially pro and basically uh i was trying to justify making the purchase to my boss and I, i'm just i wanted to give him some good one-liners i would yeah. be able to do these things quicker using that but they don't even like sell it to that point exactly, even on their own site. It's just like, hey, want to go pro? You get this stuff. And <laughs> it, okay. it's, it's a little confusing. Yeah, well, I'll post the link in, in there to the Slack that Comrade is in, the developer. Um, and you, he's really good at answering questions in there. There's a lot of people that you know jump in and help as well. So feel free to join the Slack. Um, that's probably your best place because you can talk directly to Comrade, the, the, the dev of ACF Extended. and and can can help you answer those kinds of questions i think all right thank you cool no <clears> worries <throat> as i said we're in there so you know if you find bugs then you're not sure if they have extended then we we tend to jump in and be like hey yeah no that's our fault we'll uh, we'll get that fixed in the next release cool cool 
Cool. We've got some questions in chat now. We'll just pass them before I start talking. Yeah, we've got one on reusable blocks. And we have one inside of the Q&A. OK, yeah, sure. Uh, right, I'll start with Marcel's question from chat about the reusable blocks. Um, so this is having many reusable blocks on a page. If I'm honest with you, this is something that I would want to test and find out exactly how that how that behaves when there's so many on the page. You obviously test reusable blocks, but not in a kind of, yeah, put 500 on the page or whatever. I suspect because of the way they're stored in the WordPress database, they, they'll work very similar to normal ACF blocks anyway, which is that if we can preload it, then we will do. And I get that that can be an issue. We have filters that disable that preloading system if you want to turn that off. And then it will run the like normal blocks, you know, where, where you've added a new block and we, we do an Ajax call. The reason we have preloading is because uh, there's a lot of web hosts out there that just can't handle the amount of Ajax calls. You know, if you've got 30 or 40 blocks on a page, then you'll just get start getting 503s or, or whatever else in the server just saying there's too many requests, I'm not going to handle it. So that's why preloading is there, because for kind of the universal experience, that works better. But I, I completely get that the size of the DOM when you're preloading that many blocks is is not fun and can also cause problems. So it might be worth just playing around with turning turning that off, uh, turning off preloading and then letting the Ajax rendering happen. Uh, I can find the filter for that. And Marcel says in chat that it, it's slow with five to seven reusable blocks on a page. And is that because obviously a reusable block can have multiple blocks inside of it, right? I think I'm oh, right, right in saying that. I'm looking at Anna. You can do reusable <laughs> inside of reusable, right? <laughs> yeah, a reusable block is kind of that? like a. Yeah, right? I think so, right? You, a reusable block is kind of a, a, a. You can have as many blocks as you want inside of it, especially if it's like a group that then has multiple ACF blocks as well. Uh, but. If you uh, that's the uh, that's the code to drop in. Uh, if you do that on ACF init on the ACF action hook, um, that will turn off preloading. Try that, see if it works any better for you. It obviously doesn't have any impact on the front end. It's a pure admin thing. Um, and yeah, let us know. Uh, drop drop us a tweet or you know come back to us at the next ACF chat Fridays and we can pick this up based on on that. I'm but we'll also to see if this is like a wider issue too and core. <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll go ahead and and do some testing of that as well and and make sure that we, we're there. OK. All right, Marcel. So, so the suggestion there is that it's slow because of the all the Ajax calls that happen, which suggests that they aren't preloading. So yeah, we'll, we can go away and test that. Um, they should be preloaded, because they should just behave like any normal block. And if WordPress, if WordPress you know, renders it server side, then it gets added to the cache. Uh, inside ACF, and then that's what we load from. So, yeah, we'll 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 go ahead and test that. That that could well be a bug. Um, and yeah, if so, we'll we'll get it fixed. Uh, uh Earl's question: uh, When using ACF load field to populate values for a select, runs on the front end and loads the field values on the front end. If you find a property of an API or a huge list, it isn't good for performance. Okay, yeah, I get you. So that's the um okay, so that's using load field to dynamically talk to an API or something like that, for example, I assume in this case, you know, a list of countries or something like that that comes from a third party API that you run a server side and then populate the select with. I guess the the question there is whether you're using uh, a stylized select to uh, style select field, because if you are, then you could make that API call happen as part of the query filter rather than the load field filter. Um, and if you did it on the query filter, then it would only ever load at the point that yeah, the results are queried. And obviously it would save the, the ones that have been selected. 
you probably would still want to cache on that because obviously it's like a live preview as you start typing it would do the query multiple times. So you'd probably still want to have some sort of cache in place, but you could just do that with a transient in your code to, to detect that. I think that's probably, probably the way to do it. Uh, does that make sense? Feel free to yell if I've completely misunderstood the question, but I think that's, that's no, right. yeah, it makes sense. Um, I feel like I've, I've tried to offload those to the Ajax and I had a problem with that. I can't remember what it was. I, I honestly, I think it was a visual problem where like we have a lot of fields and it gets a little cramped. And I think when you, I use the Ajax version, the, um, the like the ACF didn't compute the heights properly and the overflow was weird. But I could be misremembering, so I'll go back and test that out. If it is, I'll I'll file a GitHub issue. But um, that, yeah, that's cool. um, I'll, I'll try that out again. Nice. We changed a bunch of the selective styling in six, so it's possible that that kind of got fixed as a, as a side effect of us actually kind of considering how that stuff works and looks, um, and even more so in six point one because we added our new select two that's styled for the field type selection. So there's a bunch of new CSS in there that that kind of make sure that that renders properly. So we're kind of fixing a lot of that stuff along the way, but yeah, yellow if it's not, and the, we, can, we can get an issue raised to, to fix it. Okay, and then for ones that can't take advantage of that, um, I don't know if the multi-select can use the Ajax, but um, it, do, is there anything inherently wrong if I just don't load the choices array for a select on the front end? Uh, so the problem is not loading the choices around the front end. If it was just a normal select, I would, I suspect then if they then saved it, it would delete all of your choices. So you'd have to, you'd have to put some, some code to kind of intercept that and handle that yourself as well. Um, well, I just mean like, like no one would be at modifying the field on the front end. It would be just like when I use get field, it will still get the okay. values proper. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, because because I guess if you call get field, load field is going to get fired as well, right? And so you're calling that mm -hmm. API every time you call get field. So you, yeah, that's definitely not the way to do it. You could, there's nothing wrong with, you know, detecting you're not in is admin essentially, and then just you know leaving choices blank. That should be fine, uh, because we're just going to return you an array of what's been stored in the database already, and we don't care if the choices have changed on the front end at all. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I think that'll work. Um, and your second question, I'll get to the, the Q and A straight afterwards, but uh, uh, preloading only works on the block front end and not block fields. Uh, to preload the block fields, so when you click them on Ajax via Ajax. So that's the, in, in the ACF block terms, we have two things. We have the block preview and the block form. They're actually React components called those two things, which is why we use that, that term. You're talking about the block form, which is the thing that contains the HTML of, you know, the select or the text input and any prepend and all that stuff, all that HTML gets rendered as the block form. That code right now really isn't very efficient. I'll be honest about that. We need to, we need to improve how that block form is loaded at the moment, because we try to keep the, the, the block form looking the same as, you know, classic editor. So that people know exactly what they're getting and it looks and feels the same. That's why it just renders the, the same HTML and then we put it into the block editor. Um, I'd like to improve that kind of significantly anyway, and do a lot more things in, in native react components, you know, get a JSON list of the fields and then render it, so a front, render it on the front end rather than rendering it server side. So yeah, absolutely. I, I suspect that that's something that's going to get improved significantly over the next few months when we kind of play around a bit. I think it's probably going to be a case of throwing some stuff at the wall. Um, in dev and, and just kind of seeing what sticks and, and where we can get performance gains out of it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Nice. Uh, move to the Q and A. Uh, yeah. Okay. So Michael is asking about uh, ACF, the import from CPT UI and how that correlates to the GraphQL and the GraphQL ACF plugin. That's an interesting question. Um, and this is specifically about, you know, I've got configuration in CPT UI for GraphQL. Is that going to get imported into to ACF? We've, we discussed this a little bit and I actually don't know where, where we landed on it. 
whilst we can import everything in CPT UI, and that will just work, it does require you to already have WP GraphQL for ACF installed, registering the same fields before you do the import. And so there's a bit of a, there's a kind of a race condition there that if you import before you install this new version of, of GraphQL for ACF, uh, and then, you know, you then update the form or update the, the post type or taxonomy, we'll lose that additional data because we pass back everything you've sent and build it into the right type of array. So in theory, the answer is yes. Once that version of, of GraphQL for ACF has been released, if you install that and then do the import, everything's just going to work fine, um, which I guess is is the answer to the, the question. Um, and we're still trying to figure out if there's a way you know, we can be smarter about s s keeping data that isn't currently important or isn't currently registered to a third party ACF plugin, but might need to in the future. Cool. I think that's uh, everything on the Q and A. Any anyone ask any questions? Anyone building anything cool? Anyone played with CPT UI, uh, CPTs and taxonomies yet, or the the import for CPT UI? Any feedback or questions about how that works, or anything that didn't feel right? We had a we had a few people say that you know they expected to see. Or the internal post types listed on our post types page, or uh, there's a couple of things along that kind of vein. So we're looking into looking into feedback like that and seeing if there's a way we can do that. I think one of the questions was, "Hey, if I've got this, you know, how, can I edit the default post type in ACF and then save it?" And we're we're having conversations around how viable that is, and we kind of. There's a lot of risk of being in race conditions, obviously, depending on where your code loads a, a, a custom post type already. If it's in a theme, could we then pick it up and, and allow you to edit it in a, ACF in our UI? Because obviously people people like the UI, which is great. Uh, but yeah, any other, any other feedback, any questions? Like so far, I just use like, uh just re-edit um a post type inside acf so i i wasn't even aware i think there was a sync for like importing the settings from cpt ui uh or or in my head i was kind of kind of getting afraid that in some way it would see us as a double uh, post type registry so it wouldn't add it so um in that case what we just did is that we just moved the basic information over so uh the labels for singular and plural uh, I was pleased to see that was like automatically filling out like all the rest of the labels is one of the things I always get annoyed by is that like a lot of people add just like a post type and they never adjust <laughs> the labels to provide like it's always just new item it's just always item instead of like the uh, singular label yeah um, <clears throat> but I was pleased to see that in there oh that's cool yeah we we uh, Dale our designer um he spent a lot of time that's kind of the thing he obsesses about is those little details of how people are actually going to use it and the things that would annoy him. So there's a lot of that, that, that generate labels button and the clear labels thing. We weren't going to add that in 6.1, but after me, me and Dale using it for a week, we were like, I've typoed so many times that we have to have that in 6.1. There's no way we can't because it's, it's annoying us. So it's going to annoy users. Um, yeah. For now, I usually use like, um, uh, with text expander, I just had like one large uh, pop-up settings field. So I just had like one place to fill out like a singular and plural and will populate it all. And I just paste it inside my um, child theme uh, functions file or like a specific PHP file for registration. So that was what I was using so far. Uh, but just having an easy to go, like a gr really granular settings for like inside ACF already, like I think it makes it a little bit more usable for other people. So if you hand it off to a client and they just want to be like uh, set it to a different position inside um, like the back end, like if it's a little bit more savvy client that's able to do it. Um, but <clears throat> no, I think it just get, makes it just a little bit easier without having two different plugins to do it. So yeah, for sure. Cool. We, we've had we've had some people that 
yeah, they're never going to have this enabled on our client website because they don't trust them. And that's fine. You know, I've worked at an agency. I know there are some clients you definitely don't want to trust with access to that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But uh, like they're, they're using it purely as a, hey, I can do this to, to select all the options I need and not have to worry about conflicts because, you know, we handle that, you know, displaying settings that aren't valid anymore. So, you yeah, know, there's all the conditional logic that you're used to from ACF being there. Um, and then they just export it using the the export as PHP function um, to get the code out and just shove it in the theme, and yeah, that's that's yeah. the end of it. With, you yeah. mentioned something about you know being nervous about CBTUI and and you know what if there's duplicate registrations. We think we've handled that pretty well. Um, no, I've not seen anyone talk about it yet, which is a good sign. It means it's not happened. But there's a whole bunch of checks we do, and and we'll even show that we have aborted registering your post type because it's already registered by another post type or taxonomy. Um, and you get a little icon that says, you know, registration failed and some info on, on how to solve it. So in theory, that should be fine. But I understand you're, you know, you don't know what CPTY is going to do, right? So if, if we registered it before them, then would, would they just try and register it and you get a WordPress warning? That seems to be the worst case though. We tested that a bunch to make sure that, you know, there wasn't fatals or anything like that. So worst case seems to be uh, WordPress warnings. I think it was just one of the things that always made me like not even look for a sync like import, but and I don't know. I, I didn't see it. Maybe I just wasn't looking for it. Often it's like it's right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, but no, I, think, I get it. Yeah. So I was just thinking about it. I think that would be one of the things because you usually want to keep the uh, the, the post type slug the same, just the actual name of the post type so that was what in my head got confusing because when you then save it what does it do is it kind of kind of deactivated in cty or how does it deal with that or if it's just giving a warning that that post app has already been registered because you want to keep the posts and all the information in it um <clears throat> so yeah. yeah so we do validate that as well so if there's a if at a point that yeah, you type in a new post type, if you try and hit save and we detect that it's already registered, we'll flag that, hey, this isn't going to work because it's already registered. Um, so yeah, you definitely get warned about it. I guess you could argue that, well, hey, I want to still be able to save when that happens. And yeah, I'll disable CPTUI afterwards to avoid downtime or anything like that. But we kind of assume that most people are doing this in a, yeah, they're not doing it on production, right? So. It's yeah, not the end of the world they if they have to do it just... there. <laughs> yeah, actually, I should say that. Don't do that on production, everybody, please. <laughs> um, so you'll uh, you'll kind of get the heads up of, hey, it's, you know, it's in my theme, it's in CPTUI or something like that, and and we'll uh, we'll grab it for you first. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah, Michael mentioned about you can use ACF JSON as well. So if you've got uh, an ACF JSON folder in your theme. Um, I, creating a new CPT, you'll just automatically get everything saving properly as you'd expect to the JSON, so that you can commit it to Git and then sync it across websites and things like that. So there's a there's there's kind of that process that you're used to from field groups and fields. If you use ACF JSON, um, and I know not not an awful lot of people do, it's a, it's, it's kind of a feature that we don't yell about enough, I think. Uh. Michael, your question about validation, uh, validation even, to highlight content that doesn't meet the rules and prevent saving. Are you talking about uh, in fields and field groups or in post types and taxonomies? In, in field groups, and not in fields. So we have kind of a word count, suggested word count on, um, on content. Um, and um, we don't want to prevent saving. We just want to kind of flag up and uh, put some kind of notice. So at the moment, we're... we're um, Doing that on 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 load of the uh, content uh, and inserting injecting some notices around the fields, uh, but it would be good to piggyback on top of the uh, validation stuff instead. Yeah, cool, right? So that is a, a specifically about on the editor flow, right? So you're adding content to fields that you've already defined, rather than on the field definitions themselves. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. Cool, yeah. So we have filters for that. Um, you can do that. Let me send the link here. Uh, we have ACF validate value, which is a filter that can run and you can specify it based on field types, specific field keys, or just the name, you know, like you're probably used to from ACF filters. Um, and you can, you get the, the, the current valid status of that field, 
uh, its value, the whole field, and then the input name. And you can run whatever validation you want to do on that. Um, you can just put your own code in there that just you know detects something's gone wrong. Um, if you return, uh, you return a string from that, I believe. Yeah, look at the example you can see there. Return a string from that, which is you know what you want the error message to be if it doesn't pass the validation. Um, and then uh, yeah, but that should all just work. So the issue there is that I don't want to prevent saving. So I want I want to kind of have define word counts, but still allow okay. them to save if they're outside of the the word count. So kind of it's more of a warning rather than a strict validation of content. Yeah. So there's a there's probably a couple of ways of doing that. You could do it on. So you, you could do it on. So you could just allow save and don't do it on validate value at all. If you did it on load field, you could. Uh, at that point, you could use the, you could add it as as a sort of HTML that would appear above the field manually. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of of, of what that value would That's be. That's pretty much what we do. So the problem where... it works well, but it um, it means that it only load it, it only does it on load, and it doesn't kind of do it as they're saving it. So kind of the horse is bolted by that point because they've yeah. moved on to, to to doing something else. Um, and um, and it's a bit of a bit of a hack to be honest. Um, it would be nice to be able to kind of do it on the validation, and then it sort of warns it at, at, the, at, the, at the point where they save the content. I I'm going to guess that you could do this with the JavaScript API uh, because that also is executed in the chain before we allow saving, and you could almost certainly uh, hook into the validation from the JavaScript side and and run the validation there. And then, you know, you'd have to write your own code there, admittedly, to, to kind of basically prevent saving once and then allow them to save the second time they tried uh, and throw the warning. But yeah, that feels like something that the JavaScript API would be better for. Um, it's, it's definitely an interesting one. I, I don't know how like, it would be too much of a, I'm trying to think of a way of backwards compatible kind of adding that to the validation system. Uh, but yeah, I'll give it some thought. So would this be like a, would it be like a message like on save? It says like, okay, you have had these fields that need to be addressed and maybe like a button that says save anyway. Like, is that sort of the flow that yeah, you're that, hoping that for? Thing. Um, and I mean, we, we also kind of plan to build it into kind of some kind of content audit. So for, for a given piece of, um, of, of content that it kind of lists out all the, the ways that they've written bad content. Um, so that would be again sort of aggregating all of the invalidation errors and presenting it as a, a panel at the top of the page or something like that. So um, I mean, as I say, we've done it on, based on load field and it, it kind of works, but um, it'd be it'd be nice to make more use of data functionality if we can. Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. It's almost like we need we need to add support for validation from warnings as well as errors, right? Yeah, that kind of thing would be would be kind of ideal. I did look through the code and it didn't seem like it was. Possible yeah, understand. yeah, it's definitely not possible at the moment. Um, and I know our validation in Gutenberg needs some work anyway. But yeah, well, uh, Mike's here. He writes up a, a kind of a, a list of of things that we need to take away, and we'll absolutely get that on the feature request list. And uh, it, next time Ian's back uh, next week, we'll uh, have a chat about it. Because yeah, I agree that would be cool. That's that would also work for the thing we were talking about. Of of you know, you might want to save a post type name that already exists. On your new custom post type, um, because you're you know you're just copying it in and you're going to delete the code from somewhere else later. But so we could throw the warning there and uh, and show it. I think Dale's actually yeah. already designed warning notices for field validation, but obviously they're useless at the moment because you can't actually do them. But I remember seeing that in a Figma design recently. So, so that would be like almost like an option for like on a field that says required instead say like warning only instead of required only yeah I think right? so. it's interesting yeah. so then we could have like a banner that's yellow for those and then red for the ones that are required and don't let you go on hmm. yeah and that, the the thing you talked about about content validation and that kind of thing i know that's really important to to the you know the editor flow so that that absolutely makes sense and, and if we give you a way you know when you load the field to flag that there is a this validation warning, then obviously that makes your your content workflow and all that stuff much easier because you can uh, you'll know about that at the point that you load the the post type rather than uh, having to manually check every time. 
Cool. All right. Well, we'll take that one away. Uh, and Curly asks, is there a way to add a character limit indicator to fields that use character limits or plan to implement one? That's a really good idea. Um, yeah, we should, we should do that. We'll, uh, we'll add that to the video request list as well. That feels like something that we Where's can do that really at? I easily. don't see that one. That's in the Q and A. Oh, so okay. even Ant is, is, is aware of the, where the Q and A button is. Zoom really needs to do a better job of that because nobody ever, nobody yeah. ever can find it. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I like that uh, idea. That's yeah, really that's cool. a good idea. And we've, we've, we've started to do a bunch more, you know, in 6.0, obviously we've, we've improved that UI and the UX of how all that stuff works anyway. So yeah, it's kind of logical that, that we get down to that kind of thing. And obviously, uh, you know, in Gutenberg, if we start using React components with forms, then that stuff becomes a lot easier. So. Cool. All right. Five minutes left. Any, any other? Any other questions? How are we doing? You got any uh, any questions, Mike? Anything you're working on at the moment that's interesting? Well, um, actually, I'm wondering what people would rather see first, a in-depth tutorial in the clone field or an in-depth tutorial on option pages? Wait, can I do polls? Is that a thing I, I'm allowed to do? I think we yeah, do actually. We do have that capability somewhere. Oh, I, I, I read about this earlier. Basically, when Ian wasn't here, I'm an alternative host for this, which means I'm allowed to be a host. But he has to hit a button that allows me to create polls, and he clearly hasn't do that. Hasn't Just done that because I, I can't. I'm not yeah. allowed to create polls. So sorry. <laughs> Just yell, yell in chat if you've got a preference. Maybe. Mm. Uh, I don't know. I, I was going to say we're doing a doing a Motocom reply, but I don't know how you get options pages or the, or. Yeah. How do we log that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Options. Options got two, two thumbs up. It's in the lead. Yeah. Well, one of those is from me. I was just thinking we're all for participating. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, so uh, Michael was just talking about how we, uh, he's already doing using low field to handle character counts. So yeah, it sounds like that would be useful for everybody. Uh, we're, we're doing some work on options pages at the moment. I actually saw some really cool designs earlier. Um, Ian's not here, so I better not show you them or I'll get in trouble, but we'll, uh, we'll start showing off some of the, some of the cool stuff that we've got in the pipeline coming soon. I think in these things, just kind of give you an idea. So yeah, there's a tease come along, come along to the next one of these in two weeks and uh, maybe you get to see something. Uh, I'll be honest, I could do with the, the documentation on the clone field because I get people asking me questions about that all the time. And I'm like, yeah, I've used it. I know roughly how it works. You know, we do, you can prefix, you can do do things, but yeah, I'm sure there's more detail to it than, I've, than even I've gone into. Uh, Nick, you got a question? Yeah, real quick. Thanks, Liam. Um, so I've been using, I have to go back to this uh, ACF extended thing. Um, I've been using, ACF extended for so long. I went to a, one of my websites and just deactivated it and went back to ACF. And I, I, I'm face to face with something I've wondered for a long time. It's very hard to tell sometimes with plugins what's coming from what plugin, right? So yeah. I'm in the interface here and I, I don't really, I don't even see a settings option. So settings that must have been coming from ACF extended. Um, so if I were to not use ACF extended, how do you just toggle on um, PHP sync or or JSON sync? Is that just code or is that a is that a toggle feature? Yeah. So that is a so the PHP sync and the ACF JSON sync happening automatically. So yeah, you, know, you don't have to hit any buttons. That is a uh, that is an ACF extended feature uh, in ACF call. Every time you make a change, you'll see sync available, um, and and in the in the kind of table of contents, essentially of, of the field group or the post type of text on where you're on, they'll the options of what you can do are there. So we don't have the automatic sync yet, um, and yeah, I think that's on our to do list at some point, uh, because we prefer it to be a kind of yeah. Tra traditionally, people don't want code changing automatically, right? They want it, it wants to be a, an action that they take. So. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why there's not that 
ACF not having a settings page is an interesting one. And it's something that we've talked about a lot because there's a lot of times where we could do with it, right? There's, there's a lot of all the settings in ACF. If you go to our documentation on, on, on the ACF settings page, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do, but they all currently require code to do. Um, do you think, and uh, ask the whole room this, do you think that that is something we should enable in the UI? You know, a list of every ACF setting and let you turn it on and off? Or do you think that that's, you know, moving too much towards being this UI tool and, you know, ACF is... Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I do like the idea, especially if I were to, you know, get off the um, extended, um, but, you know, if, if I did, I just didn't, until now, I mean, it's been years since I've had it turned on. So I didn't even realize that there, that settings were actually being turned on from that other plugin. So, but one of the things kind of related to it is, um, and maybe not, well, I, I run like a multi-site monolith kind of site, um, and we use a, a similar template for everything. And so we have ACF on everything. Um, and one of the syncing things that I'm dealing with is that slug. So I get these random slugs with the, you know, with the generated IDs, and I'd prefer them just to mimic the field group name and really i would prefer if it would snatch the um the um the network site name because they're all kind of being muddied especially when i'm using the same parent theme on some of these sites i'm having to go and manually name that slug down there which is you know not a big deal but it ends up uh you know saving right you know right, right away with a weird name and i didn't know if that was something that people have dealt with on a multi-site level where, you know, dealing with these group names that, you know, semantically don't make much sense. Yeah. So, so this is an interesting one because ACF technically doesn't support keys. I should be different here because keys are slightly different than slugs in some cases of being, you know, anything other than group underscore or post type underscore or taxonomy underscore now. Um, and we had some issues when we released 6.1 of folks that have modified them uh, in ACF JSON. Uh, they would, they, you know, they're no longer available because ACF no longer knew how to tell what they were. And but obviously before post types and taxonomies, we could just assume everything was a field group. Um, and we can't do that anymore. So we reverted that behavior back in 6.1.1, I think it was, or 6.1.2, one of the one of the quick releases we did after after the main release. To assume that things are field groups if you know if we can't figure out what it is. But it's a it's an interesting use case that we didn't really we didn't really expect people to be doing, right? Uh because yeah, as I said, if if you then used ACF JSON to to sync that in after you've modified a group key, it would just get changed back. ACF would always just change it back to group. So it was only folks that were storing field groups in JSON and then never touching them, basically never letting them be imported or anything like that, that, that this problem affected, but it was a, it was just something that we hadn't realized people, people were using or even needed. And my, my main goal is not necessarily like syncing and using that. It, it's mainly for revision control, just to be able to keep up with changes as they iterate through the, you know, using the WP admin to make changes. You could easily change something and not remember what you did. So as long as you document that, freezing that in your repo, it's it's good. So um, I just didn't know if there was a settings thing I'm missing here or what. So yeah, well, okay. I mean, as I said, if, feel free to carry on asking us questions in in the uh, in the ACF Slack. It's probably the best thing to do. Um, I know we've run out of time, so sorry I can't go too much too deep into that but yeah let's uh let's carry on the conversation and uh and we'll figure out what we can do in acf to make your life easier um and hopefully with uh, comrade of, of acf extended we can kind of unmuddy the waters of what what comes from where all right can you drop links to join those slack groups i couldn't get into the extended one either uh yeah it's, it... it's wpacf.slack.com i think Did that, can we does anybody do, else can we just join yeah you should be able to it should just ask you to, uh, to, to, you know, register. Uh, all I see is a login option and it says I'm not a member. Me too. I think we need invites. Ah, okay. Interesting. All right. So that, that's the link that comrade has on the ACF extended.com. So I will, I will chat to him. We'll figure out what's going on there. That should be the link. Uh, so yeah, we'll, uh, I'll find out 
what's happening there and uh, we'll put it in the in the blog post this week that Mike will write up and we'll go live next week with, with the actual link but maybe just check that you're on in a few hours and hopefully there'll be an option that lets you join thank you cool all right well thanks everyone we're out of time uh, we'll be back in two weeks uh the same time 3 p.m uk time um i know we got confused with time zones on tweets and we started using UTC because we're like, that's fine. Everyone in Europe will understand it. And then we got confused when it, when UK changed time zones. So yeah, 3 p.m. UK time, 4 p.m. most of Europe time. And uh, I don't know, what time is it for you, Ant? 14 <laughs> UTC and uh, yeah. 9 Central. <laughs> yeah, 9 Central, these Americans. All right, thanks for coming, everyone. And see you soon, hopefully.